to this morning. Appreciate your being here at the 950 service. Also, this is the one we broadcast online, and thank you for joining us online if you are doing so uh, this morning. I had the opportunity to travel to Okatia, Honduras several years back. Lifeline does a great work down there in their medical clinic, had an opportunity to work in there for a couple of days, and they really operate a wonderful ministry globally uh, on a shoestring budget, do a lot of great things. So do stop by if you'd like any more information about that. There are some symbols that become very familiar to us in life. There are symbols or logos that are easily recognizable that have a marketing impact that a lot of corporations put out. In fact, I'm going to run through several symbols, and you'll be, probably most of these you're going to recognize very readily. Just see if you can identify with what company or name brand it is associated. Here's the first one. What does this symbol mean? Twitter, very good. What does this one mean? Dominoes. I had to put a food one in there. All right. This one, what's this symbol mean? NBC. Very good. Next one? Nike. Nike. Very good. Here's one. Pepsi. It goes good with Domino's. Uh, Next one? Amazon. How many of you have ordered from Amazon already this morning? I see some hands going up. Package will be there when you get home. What's this symbol? National Geographic. Very good. Here's one. Toyota. Okay, very good. All right, what's the next one? Apple. That was an easy one. And here's one more. That's what you'll need at the end of the sermon when we get done. You know, certain symbols automatically bring to our minds a product or a company. In Jesus' day, there would not have been many logos like that, like we have today. But there would have been some very familiar scenes that Jesus could use so that people would understand what he was saying. Today, we come to the third I Am statement that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John. We're in this series called I Am, looking at the several I Am statements in the Gospel of John. And this third one is actually one of the more toughest I Am statements Jesus makes because we're unfamiliar with its symbolism. However, for those to whom Jesus was speaking directly, they would have immediately understood its significance. The third and the fourth I am statement, which will be next week, occurs back to back in John chapter 10. So today we'll notice the third one, next week we'll notice the fourth one. The third one is, I am the door, or sometimes it's translated, I am the gate. And to understand what it means, we have to dive into a familiar occupation of the first century, that of being a shepherd. If there had been a symbol for the third and the fourth I am statements of Jesus, it most likely would be something similar to this. It'd probably include a sheep and a shepherd in the picture. So I want you to turn to John chapter 10, and we're going to begin by looking at this familiar illustration that Jesus used with this statement. It begins John chapter 10 and verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. The statement, I am the door or I am the gate, is going to occur just a little bit later on in verses 7 and 9, which we'll get to in just a few moments. Jesus is using this familiar illustration to provide a comparison for his audience. And the comparison is a thief who would steal a sheep and a shepherd who would protect his flock. If you remember from a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that these I am statements are all rooted in various Old Testament passages as well. And while many Old Testament passages would talk about a sheep and his shepherd, the most familiar one is Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so when Jesus said, I am the gate, the type of gate or door to which he is referring is one that would be used for sheep pens that were built along the side of buildings in a town or a village. The pens would have these sturdy walls around them and a completely enclosed locking door or gate. Often these places were owned or they were managed by another shepherd whom Jesus calls in what is really a parable here, the gatekeeper. And so shepherds would often pay rent to put their sheep in overnight 
night to keep them protected. Now, if a person didn't want to enter in through the gate, they would have to climb over the walls, which means most likely they were thieves. Thieves would want to steal the sheep but not hurt them. They wanted the sheep in good condition so they could sell them later. But when a shepherd was out grazing his flock in a field uh, in the evenings and away from the city and nightfall would come, he would then build a temporary shelter for his sheep, a sheepfold. Basically, it's like a portable fence built with some sticks and some rocks. And then he would provide an entrance so they could come in and out as they needed to graze farther out. And what the shepherd would do is he would literally lie in front of that opening to protect the sheep through the night. In the book, They Smell Like Sheep, Dr. Lynn Anderson writes, with the whole flock examined and bedded down finally, the shepherd himself would lie down stretching his body across the opening. So the shepherd literally physically became the door. His body kept the sheep in and the dangers of the night out. Now, if you were raised on a farm, and some of you were, you know that corrals become very important, and to corral your animals is important, and it's very important to keep the gate closed and not allow the gate to get open. About four years ago, my good friend Jason Likens had come up here to preach. We'd been on vacation in California, got back on a Friday. On Saturday, he drove up, and I brought him out here so he could practice his sermon on Saturday night before preaching it the next morning. And we got ready to leave, and as we're going out the Broad Street entrance, there's a horse standing at the Broad Street entrance. And we're like, okay, this is not the normal thing that should be happening out here. And so we backed up the car very slowly, didn't want to agitate or scare the horse, backed up, came down the York Road. There's one standing out here in the parking lot on the east side of the church building. My friend Jason, who is from Kentucky, he's like, you know, down in Kentucky, we'd do this kind of thing. Not up here in Ohio. We didn't think I'd come up here to wrangle horses. But the neighbor that owns the 50 acres of property south of the church had accidentally forgot to lock his gate, and the wind blew it open, and the two horses saw it open, and out they went galloping. We like to never got those things uh, back in. In fact, one of them came right to us. The other one took about two more hours before we were able to get it back in there. So I've gone from preaching to to horse wrangling in, in the last few years. But Jesus is giving his listeners a clear picture of what they already know. And that is without a gate, without a gatekeeper, thieves could break in and steal one of these sheep or predatory animals could attack them. So when David writes in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, and then later he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Those were tools the shepherd would have with him, especially through the night. If a sheep tried to get out and he didn't want to get out, he would use that staff, which was a stick with a a crook on the end of it to pull it back in. But the rod was basically a large stick he would use to beat off predatory animals. So Jesus was talking to a crowd that would have understood the necessity, understood the meaning of gates. The city gate in the Old Testament was a place where uh, important business transactions occurred. Maybe you remember the story of Ruth in the Old Testament where Boaz went to the city gate when he wanted to marry Ruth, and basically at that city gate, a town council meeting was held to legalize their marriage. We're told in the Old Testament that Samson tore an entire city gate loose in Gaza and carried it some distance away up on a hill. Now, that would not be like just the gate we'd think of on a fence today. A gate in those days literally meant the gate and the part that held the gate up. And Samson carried that entire gate up on a hill several miles out of the city. That's to tell us how strong Samson was physically. But gates are used figuratively in the Bible as well. Psalm 24 says, lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. So that was a figurative use, probably referring to the city gates of Jerusalem. Jesus one time said the gates of hell would not overcome his church, meaning the power of death will not harm his people. The British Broadcasting Company, the BBC, ran a report several years ago how shepherds have turned to other and more sophisticated methods of keeping sheep safe within a pen. One method is a metal hoof-proof grid that's placed where the gate closes. If the gate is open, the sheep ideally would not cross over it knowing they would get stuck. Now, sheep are not normally known for their intelligence, but a group of sheep in Yorkshire, England, were not only prone to stray, but they had become very crafty. One of the sheep learned to transgress that boundary, and it laid down and rolled over the grid. The other sheep in the flock followed and did the same thing. And soon the sheep spread all over the countryside, and they found their way into neighborhoods where they ate the vegetation and flowers of the local residents. The sheep were rounded up, 
but they, the shepherds didn't know what was happening, and they escaped again. This herd, by the way, was dubbed as the black sheep. That's the joke, by the way, the funny part. It's where you laugh. This herd was dubbed as the black sheep of Yorkshire. And while the adventure may have seemed very exciting for the sheep, to the shepherds it became a great source of anxiety as they would wander into nearby roads or were accosted by local dogs. This I am statement is a comparison of a thief who is trying to steal a sheep and the shepherd who is trying to protect the same sheep. But this I am statement also provides a combination of freedom and security. Look on down in verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who've come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Philip Keller has written a book entitled A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. He says that for sheep to feel secure, there are four criteria that must be met. A sheep has to be free from fear. A sheep has to be free from friction with others in the flock. A sheep has to be free from the parasites and pests. And a sheep has to be free from hunger. But security must also be coupled with freedom. And yet we know there's not freedom just to do whatever somebody wants. For example, you're free to drive a vehicle if you're secure in your training, and there are parameters for doing so. You drive on the right side, you drive within the speed limit, you know how to use your headlights, your wipers. A sheep was free to roam safely within the confines of the sheepfold, and it provided security. But once the sheep got out of the sheepfold, the security was lost. Lynn Anderson writes, shared about how he and his wife were on a bus tour in Israel, and their tour guide shared how sheep can be attacked. And the guide pointed out that the shepherd guides the sheep. He doesn't drive them. He feeds the sheep. He cares for them. And the shepherd normally does not have to be harsh with the sheep because they know his voice and they will automatically follow. But when the tour guide shared on the previous tour, he was telling the same story, and everybody started staring out the window at a guy that was chasing a herd of sheep. He was actually throwing rocks at them, watching and whacking them with sticks, and then having his dogs attack them. And the sheep driving man in the field had ruined the guide's enchanting narrative. So the guide was so agitated, he had the bus driver stop. He got off, ran into the field, and accosted the man and said, Do you understand what you've just done? I was spinning a charming story about the gentle ways of shepherd, and here you are mistreating, hazing, and assaulting these sheep. What is going on? And the guy that was chasing the sheep had this bewildered look on his face, but then suddenly the light clicked on, and he said, Man, you have me all wrong. I'm not a shepherd. I am a butcher. And Jesus tells us that very thing. Satan is a butcher. Jesus said, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus then says, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Do you understand that Satan wants to bind us in sin? Satan wants to take away our security. Satan wants to destroy our faith. He wants to destroy our relationship with God. But we have this Savior who stands literally in the gap, who's willing to be our defender if we allow him. Jesus provides us freedom and security. Now, there are several truths from this passage that I want to pull out. These are truths that you already know. These are statements that I'm going to make that most of you are very familiar with. But I want them to just be a sort of a reminder and a reinforcement of encouragement to you today. All based simply on when Jesus says, I am the door or I am the gate. Here's the first one. Jesus cares for you. Jesus cares for you. You know, occasionally in a business world, busy world, we need to remember that Jesus is the one who cares for us so much that he was willing to go to the cross and die for our sins. There is an eternal part of Jesus caring for us. Now, in two weeks, we're going to talk about when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus comes to provide a way for us to have salvation, for us to have a promise of an eternal home. But there's also a practical part in Jesus caring for us. In this story of the shepherd and his sheep, Jesus said the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. Why? Because the sheep have been around him. 
Being a shepherd wasn't a nine-to-five job. It was a life committed to protecting the sheep and getting to know them. And so if a sheep heard an unfamiliar voice, it typically would not go with that person. Jesus Christ knows who you are. Jesus knows who I am. The Lord is powerful enough to create and to heal and to stop storms, yet He is intimate enough to know us by name. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your Father's care, and even the very, heads of your, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Maybe somebody here is feeling a little bit defeated in life today, and maybe you came to church because you just felt like nobody cares and you needed to be lifted. Maybe you have felt abandoned by a relative or forgotten by a friend, or you feel like you've been hurt by a coworker. Can I remind you that Jesus cares about you, even the smallest details of your life? And you can share those smallest details with him. If God knows the number of hairs upon our head, and with some of us, he no longer leaves a calculator, we can trust that he cares for the smallest details of all of our lives. He cares about that report you have due for work tomorrow. He cares about the doctor's appointment you have this week. He cares about that test you have in class coming up this week. He cares about the outcome of your game. Jesus cares for you. Here's a second reminder for all of us. Jesus cares enough to get you through. Jesus cares enough to get you through. You know, if Jesus is the gate, Jesus is the door, we have to walk through a gate. We have to walk through a door to get somewhere else. Now, God may not eliminate all the storms in our lives, but even when we're surrounded by threats and not spared from pain, we can still have his peace. And a sheep that felt threatened would calm down upon hearing the voice of the shepherd. A shepherd couldn't control the weather and stop the storms, but he could still provide peace for his flock of sheep. In his book, through the eyes of a lion. Levi Lesko shares about the death of his five-year-old daughter, Linya, just a few days before Christmas. Linya died of an asthma attack. Lesko writes about the pain of having to select a casket for his little girl, trying to find a cemetery where she could be buried, and then having to decide upon the hospital's request if Lesko and his wife would like to donate Linya's corneas on heart valves. Lesko writes, I wish I could say my reaction was noble, sacrificial, and generous, but it wasn't. Everything in me coiled and stiffened, and I felt myself bristle. To think of doctors cutting into my daughter made me want to break something. As Jenny and I talked and prayed about it, we thought about how Jesus was the first and ultimate organ donor. He donated his blood for us on the cross, and his righteousness was transplanted into our hearts. The rest of Lesko's book is about how one can face what seems like impossible pain, and yet in Christ you can still find incredible power. And one of the choices that Lesko said later came down the road was the marker for Linya's grave and what it would say. He said, while our family went through many tears and many questions and days of agony and grief, we finally settled on a verse of Scripture that we had embedded in an anchor because we wanted to remember that we were anchored in Christ to get us through this ordeal. And the verse is 2 Timothy 1.10, Jesus has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Lesko goes on and he shares how he and his family had to keep listening for the voice of the Lord to get them through this time. You know, a shepherd may not be able to prevent attacks on his sheep, but he could do his best to get him through the crisis. And when you think of this story of the shepherd and his sheep, if your mind's like mine, it goes back to Psalm 23, but a very specific verse in Psalm 23, verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Christian author Leonard Sweet notes there are two significant words in that sentence. He says there's the word though and there's the word through. Yea, though I walk through. And he says there's only one letter's difference. It's the letter R. And then he points out that in American Sign Language, the symbol for R is crossed fingers. In the early days of the Christian faith, people made a similar gesture with their fingers. They crossed the index and middle fingers as a sign of the cross. It was a way of identifying themselves to each other. And now over the years, that symbol has changed to being just good luck. But when the early Christians weren't sure of how a situation was going to turn out, they would cross their fingers as a way of claiming Christ's presence with them. Litter Sweet goes on and says, For us, it should remind us that Christ can turn a though 
into a through, though I'm facing layoff, though I've received this news about my health, though my child is hurting, though my finances are in shambles, I will get through. See, a Christian has a choice when trials and tests occur. We can either focus on the problem or we can focus on Christ because he has our best interest at heart. He may not remove the pain. He may not remove the storms, but he'll walk with us through them because he is the gate. He is the door. Here's one other truth. Jesus cares enough to get you to heaven. Jesus cares enough to get you to heaven. In, this, in the book, I Am Changes Who I Am, Greg Matt writes about gates. Gates change things. When you think about a gate, there's something on one side and then something different on the other side. You know, for the sheep, it was the difference between life and death because to be outside the pen without the shepherd meant either being stolen by someone or being attacked by another animal. But to be inside the pen, the shepherd with that shepherd meant safety and security, even with all the troubles that might be around them. Jesus is our gate. Jesus is our door to heaven. He'll take us from this world to the next one, and they're going to be different. Instead of anxiety and problems here, we're going to live in a perfect existence there. Our children's director, Robin Wagner, had shared with our staff in recent weeks that for some of our younger elementary age children, it's very difficult for them to grasp the idea of hell. I think one of the things that Satan has stole us from us, stolen from us is the ability for us to recognize the difference between heaven and hell. Because there is this type of universalism that just suggests everybody's going to go to heaven. Well, Jesus used the idea of Satan being a thief because without the Lord as the door, without the Lord as the gate, there is no hope for heaven. I told Robin, I said, you know, one of the ways that we could teach them a little about hell is have the, like the, the third graders and down come in and listen to a sermon. They'll hear about hell that way. They'll experience it. How does Jesus get us to heaven? The one who said he was the door, the one who said he was the gate, would later say, I'm the good shepherd. He takes on this good shepherd, takes on the role of a lamb, a helpless animal that could be attacked by predators. And here Satan thinks he's winning, but we know it's the lamb who's going to resurrect from the dead and display his power. It's Jesus being victorious over life and over death and over the grave. That's how you and I get to heaven, is when the shepherd is willing to switch roles and become the lamb. Because when Jesus began his ministry, his cousin John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I opened with some very common symbols in our world today. But the universal symbol for the Christian is the cross. Because that is where the shepherd lays down his rod and staff and is nailed to a tree. And the shepherd becomes the Lamb. Do you know the shepherd? who became a lamb, the lamb of God, who can take away your sins today. If you need to make that decision to make him your shepherd and allow him to be the lamb that would take away your sins, you can meet with me right up here near the baptistry area when the service dismisses after our time of worship and communion. And maybe today you need to make that decision to follow the shepherd and to hear his voice and to repent of your sin and accept Jesus Christ into your heart and life and be willing to publicly proclaim his name and to be willing to be baptized into him. If you need to do that today, you come. Maybe you've already done that. You'd like to bring your membership to our church. We'd love to have you be a part of it. You come as well. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, we are so grateful that Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, was willing to become the Lamb of God to take away all of our sins. We thank you that he is our door, he is our gate into the hope and into the promise of an eternal life and a better life than what we have in this world. And so God, we thank you that he tries to protect us from Satan. He tries to protect us from our predator, from our adversary. So Lord, may we stay close to his voice May we communicate with him often and clearly. And may we listen to his voice and follow and be the sheep that we need to be to be near 
our good shepherd. In his name we pray, amen.